Good morning, CollabCast listeners. This is Captain Dave Jackson coming to you from sunny Hendersonville, Tennessee. Can you hear the excitement in my voice? I am so excited today to have with us Mr. Steve Anderson. Steve is an insurance industry icon, business marketing, etc. Uh, and Steve and I have been just chatting off off camera, off screen here for a second. We live about a half an hour apart from each other and didn't know that till two minutes ago. Yep. So uh, we're both Tennessee, Nashville natives, not natives, but uh, residents. And uh, I've only lived here a little year, about a year and a half. But wow. um, I know well, I got you've a little time on you. I've been here about 25 yep. years. So yeah, yeah good, good for you. So we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But so Steve Anderson, uh, oh my gosh, a list of accomplishments. Uh, goes on and on and on. So we're going to focus on what you're currently doing and some of the things. But before we get there, I want our listeners to know a little bit about you. So I'm going to take you back. Sorry, but uh, and I'm in the same boat. Two days ago, I turned 65. So uh, I actually have a Medicare ID card there in my go. wallet now. That, that, that's a milestone, isn't it? <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'm so proud of that card. And uh, you know what? Age is just another uh, milestone, like you said, and 65 is one of them, and I get a card to prove it. Yep. So anyway, I'm now on Medicare and uh, <laughs> just enjoying it. I mean, not using it, but yes. being able to use being it. Being able to use it. So, and all the money you might to. save uh, because of it. So. That's, that's right. That's another big thing. So I've got plans for all that savings, and uh, you know, hopefully it'll come to fruition here in the next year or two. So, uh, But not... Not looking at retirement. Um, I'm loving life and living life and working uh, as hard or as strong as I ever have. And uh, I will tell you a little bit about me first and then the rest of the whole time we have is on you. Um, I've only spent my career in one industry, and that's been the insurance industry as well. Right out of college, I started work for AAA in Iowa, uh, AAA Motor Club. Some of them own their own carriers. Uh, in Iowa, it's a single line, one state, just Iowa, and the line was auto. They had, they didn't insure property or any of their lines, period. So uh, they brokered out the other lines with a national carrier, but uh, turns out auto was the thing. So I worked in the auto insurance department. I was a processing administrative supervisor for a few years, and I worked for AAA in Iowa for 11 years total. And that took me into my agency phase of my life. And uh, most of my, so I guess you call AAA in that sense a captive. Uh, but most of my career, 34 years of it, was spent on the captive side of the business. I was an Allstate agent in Iowa for six years. We decided to relocate our family and we relocated to Omaha, Nebraska. Start a second Allstate agency there. Total of 10 years with Allstate. Eventually, I went back to AAA for a short stint in Omaha and eventually then moved out to Arizona. I lived in Arizona for 13 years and uh, had a State Farm office. State Farm and I didn't see eye to eye. They booted me because I was too much of a rebel and I just wanted to sell and they wanted you to sell this, this, this and this and this. And if you don't, it doesn't work. So I, that's when I became independent. That was 10 years ago. So the last 10 years on the independent side, 44 years total in the industry, and that's all I know. So um, I, I, I've enjoyed every minute of it. It's been a huge, wild, crazy ride like most people. And so this is my lead into your career and you, your um, background in history. I stumbled in insurance. Most people would say the same thing, stumbled somehow, some way. Yep. What's your story? How did you first What's get into the stumble? insurance industry? Um, well, uh -huh. like you, um, this is the only industry I've, I've worked in um, and a little bit different because I really started on the independent side and have stayed there. How that happened, though, is the stumble. Um, mm -hmm. My father-in-law owned a independent agency in the Washington, D.C. area. And short version of a potentially longer story, he had a stroke when he was 53. Single agent, had a couple of support staff, not very big. I graduated college, wasn't sure what I wanted to do, uh, knew it was going to be something in business. And so uh, we decided that I would come in and help him out while he was recovering. 
which he did. He wasn't fully recovered uh, ever, but uh, he was able to get around and, and do business for a long time. So I came in to help him. What that looked like is I actually went to work for an insurance company um, that was located there, Reliance Insurance Company. You may or may not know some. Some will remember I, that company. Yeah, I know. I know the name. Okay. I, I never dealt with them, but um, and spent about a year and a half there um, doing a number of different jobs. Ended up being uh, an underwriter, so kind of learned the carrier side of the business uh, during that time. And then left Reliance, went to work for him, uh, and we were a big Reliance agency. So obviously that mm -hmm. that worked out uh, pretty well. And mm -hmm. then um, I ended up working with him for 13 years. And that's partly where my technology uh, stuff or bent came from, is this was, I got my li first license to sell insurance in 1978. Um, did. So you took your exam on paper with a number oh, two pencil absolutely. and filled yeah. in the ovals? <laughs> absolutely. Yep, yep. Um, and then, you know, in addition to office and processing and right, all the kind of normal stuff in a small agency, I um, took a real interest in, in computers. And in the early 80s, uh, there were a number of insurance companies that actually bought agency management system vendors, and then provided those s systems to their uh, agency force. And one of those was Travelers, who bought a company called EBS, Engineered Business Systems. And they, um, we bought that system. Uh, and I say we bought, I put that in quotes, because at that time, the carriers actually were paying for the system based on uh, premium volume increase, growth, and and profitability and some things like that. And then, so again, think about this. Now, this was a big, like a refrigerator size computer, big reel-to-reel -reel tape oh, yeah. backups. Mainframes, blink, blinking lights. Control yeah, rooms. It, was, it was kind of that mini computer, big box, hugely expensive, didn't do anything, but it was really cool. Uh, right. Meaning the you software at that it. time was just getting started. So... Lots of work there. I became a member of the user group board. I helped that vendor develop workflows and additional um, capabilities of the system. And then fast forward, I ended up leaving my father-in-law's agency after 13 years, I said that, um, primarily because um, family issues. So I was the son-in-law. The son came in, my brother-in-law, and became pretty clear after a few years what that would look like eventually and decided I didn't know that I wanted to do that. And if I had to start over, I'd rather do it sooner than later. So left the family business, which is a whole interesting thing, um, actually ended up moving to the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, my wife actually took a job there and um, I started doing consulting with agencies on technology, a lot of system selection at that time. This was in 1991. And um, met a couple of uh, guys that owned an agency. They had merged their two agencies. They approached me about coming to work with them as a producer. I agreed to do that and started building a, a book of business on uh, direct sales. They also were very um, forward thinking in terms of technology. So one example of that um, is file storage. I'm trying to think how to do the short version. File storage, meaning paper files is what agencies had. This was 92 or so. Mm -hmm. And we decided and embarked on a project to scan all of our paper files and store them electronically, which oh I was gosh, the primary so person to do that. Yeah, so and many 92, just haven't even done that yet. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was no question really early. We made a lot of mistakes, took a while to get kind of the process figured out. Uh, and agencies would just shake their head at us saying, you're going to get sued out of business and you won't have the documentation you want, right? Sure. All the stuff. Don't and, trust the, don't yeah. trust the internet. Or, yeah, or no, you computers. can, right? Uh, and again, 90s was, internet still was not great. Right. So through the 90s, did a lot of that, started doing 
writing for a, a regular column in Rough Notes on technology for agencies and really kind of helped me develop a bit of a following. And again, longer story, but short version, in um, 1999, decided to leave the agency, start my own consulting firm, uh, doing research, writing, speaking, and consulting you know, with agencies on technology. And again, 99, now we're starting to get websites and we're starting to, you know, systems were starting to get more expensive and harder to choose. And so I had a, had a lot of work over the last 25 years. So kind of the, I say end of the story, not quite, because I agree with you, I'm not, I don't have any ideas of retiring quite yet, but um, I was approached about three years ago now by three big eye state association executives who were working on a project to help their members with technology. One of the biggest questions that they get from their members, and frankly, they didn't have the knowledge, expertise, the background, the skill set in order to actually really help them. So three years or so, we worked together um, and put together what is now called Catalyst which is a platform that helps agents maximize the technology they have and then discover, evaluate, select what new stuff they might want to consider and then implement it well so that they can maximize their investment in it. So I'm co-founder and CEO of that today. So all of my consulting stuff now is part of the Catalyst platform and, and process. So that's so a really Cat quick, um, yeah, as you say, what did you say, 46 <laughs> years, I think, something like that. 44, yeah, 44 uh, I, in I July. I stopped counting a few years ago, but uh, yeah, it's mm -hmm. been a long time. So a question about Catalyst. Yeah. Is this available to me only if I'm a Big Eye member as an agency? There is, no. So it's available to any agency, um, okay. and it is a subscription model. So there is a monthly subscription fee. If you are a member of a Big Eye State Association, there is a bit of a discount on that monthly fee. Um, gotcha. And we can go in as much detail as you want in terms of, of what we do. But um, it, it's, um, as I said, it really is taking what I've done for 25 years, improving it and scaling it. And um, that excites me because now we're able to help a, a lot more agencies with what they've told us is their biggest problem. Two, two mm -hmm. biggest problems. You probably hear this all the time. All the time. Finding employees yep. and technology. Yep. So we can help them with the technology and as a kind of a, a backdoor way to help them with employees or being able to be more efficient internally with what they do and how they do it. Okay. I want to come back to Catalyst because I do have some specific Great. questions for okay. you. But before we do, I want to talk about a couple of things. So you, you've been an author. And I know you're the primary book that everybody knows you uh, as an author of. But have you authored other books as well or publications? Have, well, Not just like cat so column. You know, columns yeah, I was going to say authors. I've written my entire right. career. Um the book, the Bezos letters is the book that is my currently mm -hmm. first and only book. Um, okay. It was an interesting journey getting that put together. I don't know that I have another one in me, uh, although I do get asked that question. So. So tell us about the Bezos letters. This is a book about Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon and 12 principles of how Amazon did it the best. Am I right? Correct. Actually, 14, so, but that's okay. 14? Oh, okay. <laughs> so a lot of principles, uh, but specific ones. Can you highlight two or three of those principles and let us know wh what was it that Amazon did, in your view, so much better than all the rest? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And um, let me start with just with a little bit of background, because actually the book came out of my work in the industry. So mm -hmm. I have been part of ACT, the Agents Council for Technology, since its beginning, mm -hmm. actually. And mm -hmm. I served on a work group uh, a few years ago called The Changing Nature of Risk, where we were looking at all this emerging and new technology and how it affects customers, how it affects agencies, and what agents need to know in order to properly protect their customers. 
kind of in that whole process, I started asking the question, with technology continuing to develop so rapidly, and it has, and it still does, is the biggest risk an agency faces actually not taking enough risk? So that's kind of where that germ of an idea started. And I started researching businesses, looking at who was successful at one point and is no longer here, who is successful and is still here, and why. So what have they done differently? So we've got you know all kinds of names, BlackBerry and Blockbuster and Sears and mm -hmm. CompUSA, and right, we could talk about all kinds. Even now, you're looking at um, um, Bed Bath & Beyond, just declaring bankruptcy, all kinds of changes going on there. Came across Amazon, I would say obviously now, but maybe not as much at the time, as a company that grew, was successful, is successful, and continues to be successful. So I started looking at, okay, again, why? Which is where I came across the letters to shareholders that Jeff Bezos wrote. So the first letter, they went public in 1997. The first letter was 1997. And at the time, I went through the 2018 letter. So he wrote a letter every year. And what I realized when I sat down and read all those letters actually is one narrative. I read them like a book. I realized there were themes and, and ideas woven through those letters. And I also realized, I thought, actually, businesses could use these ideas. And so that's kind of where the concept came from. My first iteration of all of that was a, a white paper. Um, you'll appreciate this. I did a one-page executive summary of each of the letters, kind of key quotes, highlights, milestones that Amazon had hit. And I was going to give it away as a lead gen, right? Here's some things, good information. You should take a look at this. Give me your email address, name and email address, right? Typical lead gen stuff. Well, fortunately, mm -hmm. my wife has been in the book business for a long time. And I was talking to her about it. And she said, let me look at that. And so I, I sent it to her. She forwarded it to the founder of the publishing company that she was working for at the time. And they both immediately came back and said, this is a book, not a white paper. And I kind of went, oh, shit, I don't know how to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> so that started about, you know, probably 18 months, maybe a little bit longer journey of taking kind of that and putting it into a book. And that's where the 14 principles grew out of and how we grouped and categorized it. And I'm very fortunate that my wife is also an exceptional editor. And so we wrote this book together. Um, mm -hmm. And again, one of the questions I get there is, are you still married? <laughs> <laughs> and we are. And uh, it was, there were some rough, points along that process, but uh, I think the results and how the book has been received is, is, I guess, proof that it can work. That is a cool story. I did not know Basil's wrote those letters, shareholder letters. How many were there totally wrote? So he, so totally, uh, 1997, his last letter was 2020, when he oh, stepped wow. down as CEO at Amazon and then moved to the executive chairman position of the board. And um, Andy Jassy, who was CEO of Amazon Web Services, was tapped to step in and replace him as CEO. And so Jassy has written the, um, what I say, 2020, 2021, and 2022 letter going forward. So for those that haven't read your book, I have it in my library, but I admit I have not read it yet, but right, boy, I'm motivated. Okay. I, I'm motivated to now, that's for sure. Um, so a question about those that don't know, does your book relate just to business or does it any kind of a hint of in the insurance business? Well, there's no question because really the whole concept around the book is that I believe just Bezos is the master of risk. So, for example, you ask about some principles. Yeah, risk and growth mindset. Yeah. Yep, risk and growth mindset. And um, you can't grow if you don't take risks. And, and mm -hmm. you know, so many people th say entrepreneurs are natural risk takers. I would say maybe, not necessarily. And what are they doing to protect the downside? Um, so I grouped those 14 principles. It's a lot, I know. But I grouped them into what I call four cycles, test, build, accelerate, and scale. And actually, the first principle is encourage successful failure. 
because that's what Bezos does. Um, and w so my whole lens really is coming out of risk management and the view that I see in the industry still of being very conservative and risk averse. I think agencies really are the most risk averse people, even though they're entrepreneurs and they're you know doing their own business, partly because they see the worst that can happen every day, right? Claims coming in, accidents happen, right on the front line, fires right. happen, lawsuits happen, right? All those. So they they have a natural tendency, I think, to be more conservative. And in order to grow, you've got to be able, able to think. Um, I guess the way I would phrase it, you've got to be able to experiment. And by its very nature, an experiment means you're going to fail. So even when we talk about technology, the biggest issue is fear on the agency's management, what an owner, principal, management team, whatever that looks like, fear of making a mistake. I get one of the questions I get a lot in my presentations is, especially with all the new startup and insure tech and right, all the hype around stuff, what if I make a mistake? And my response is you're gonna make a mistake. So how do you protect yourself? How do you not sign a five year contract with a vendor and you don't yet really know if that platform product service is going to work well for you. I mean, there are ways to think about trying things out, experimenting, and if they don't work, get rid of them, go to the next one. Yeah, and Jeff Bezos could be considered one of the masters of that. I call him the master sure of risk discovered. in the book. Yep, yep absolutely. Yep. Because I, I, he uses risk strategically to grow. And I think that to me is the one of the core concepts in what I learned or saw in what he wrote. And, and I think the other thing I'll say, I think what makes the Bezos letters, shareholder letters more unique, uh, and I would liken them to Warren Buffett, right? People wait for those letters. Why? Because there's lots of wisdom there. And that's what Bezos did. He shared, I, I call it, you know, his, his growth plan hidden in plain sight. Uh, and that's what I hope the book does is open that up for people who aren't going to do the research I did in terms of figuring out what these look like. But I think absolutely right. they um, apply in an agency, in a carrier, in all kinds of different situations within the industry. Have you met Jeff Bezos personally? I have not. Uh, don't oh, anticipate funny. being able to. Um, and and it's interesting because I, I made a decision early on that the letters were the core of what I was going to do. That is unique in other books about Amazon. There have been other books that have some great sure. books about their history and their growth. And they interviewed all kinds of different people. I wanted and decided that the letters would speak for themselves because there was so much of Bezos in those letters. Um, and, and so that was really a strategic decision on um, my part in, in how I was going to shape this book and, frankly, how I was going to make this book different than others about mm -hmm. Amazon because there are quite a few. Definitely. Now. Yeah, definitely unique. That's for sure. Yeah. So that's one of my projects here coming up. Um, and I should have planned better. I just was on vacation last week, and I took a couple <laughs> other books. I took some Zeth Godin material. So, oh yeah, um, well, I gotta love Seth Godin. Yeah, and uh, but I like Jeff Bezos too. You yep. just, just what a you talked about strategic risk, and but you know strategic can be good or bad. It's right. still got to have some good judgment involved. So no question, and Bezos and, and I is think one that, of the better can, ones. Yeah, and that's the that's the idea of protecting the downside. Right. In, in terms of this is not just throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what works. This is being very right. intentional. And actually, Amazon has created a number of tools they use to make sure that happens. Um, so, again, I think those are some really interesting things that um, literally any business could use or even just change their thinking. I, I, I'll tell you this quick story. I got an email. Um, I'm playing around with video platforms and signed up for a service to test it. And uh, I got an email from the founder and just literally just probably a month ago now. And he said, I, I see your uh, Be Human is the platform um, user. 
and I'm thrilled because I read your book a couple of years ago, and it really changed how I think about things. And again, as an author, you know, it's just a, a bit of a glow there that, you know, with, you actually read it <laughs> and right. you got something out of it. So that's that feels good. Always good feedback. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, so the Bezos letters, your one and only book so far, and you said not sure if you'll write a second one. Is that because you and your wife would have to be involved again or what's the reason there? <laughs> well, I, I th- I think at its core. Because I just the reason I ask is, I'm sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. I just think people would be love to not because it's a company like Amazon or something, but because of your wisdom and experience in the industry. You've been in this industry just like me, the only one you've ever known. So you've seen it from so many different angles, and you know a conservative industry by today's standards still trying to manage all the aspects of this industry it's a very big industry but uh it's got a lot of growth yet to go yes it which does which is crazy yes especially when yes, we talk does. about technology right so um it's hard writing a book i think that, that that's first i would say the core right now is i stumbled across this idea this was and i think that's the right phrase of of the shareholder letters I haven't come across another idea that I think is like that. And so there's lots of stuff I could write. It's certainly industry focused, certainly technology focused, certainly For sure. co- consumer focused, right? Those kinds of things. There have been some other books in, you know, kind of the agency universe that have looked at doing that. So maybe I will do that at some at some time. I, it's been suggested, what about Elon Musk? You know, what about doing, you know, um, Warren Buffett again, but there are already stuff out there. I don't know that I have something that would be different enough that would um, appeal to the marketplace, I guess is what I would say. Right, right, right. Have you ever met Warren Buffett? I have not. Read his letters. I have. Absolutely. I have. So I, I think he has Omaha. over 40 now. So, you know, that's a lot yep. to go through. Oh, man. I lived in Omaha um, for 11 years. Both my kids graduated from high school there. And uh, I was managing, I was at AAA Life uh, in a call center. I was managing a sales group. And one of my um, salespeople was a young Mary gal, and her husband was in IT. He was a door-to-door support guy on the IT side. And somehow or another, his company assigned him the Warren Buffett um, account. So he would actually visit Warren's house, have oatmeal with him in the morning when he had (laughs) breakfast and check out his uh, desktops and laptops, whatever he had there. And we all got invited to his house one time. So I got to meet him. Oh, that's uh, in a very social, social setting. Yeah. It was incredible. That's fun. The dude, the dude's just, oh, he just thinks like nobody else yep. on this planet, you know? Yep. So that was, that was a real thrill for me. Sorry, I had to steal the show there because we were talking about That's good. how big business names and he, he's definitely one of them. So, yeah, but I mean, you're like, he's, he's 1A and you're 1AB, man. You're right behind Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos and... Elon Musk, you're all of those. In our industry, you're probably the top dog. You should know that. So don't be afraid to share your knowledge is what I'm saying. Write those right. books because I believe there's plenty of marketplace that wants to hear what you have to say. All That's right. just my own opinion. Well, thank you. So Appreciate that. If you need encouragement, <laughs> uh, the, you could go find it a million different places Yeah. Uh, because it's out there. I guarantee it just from what I know in the industry. Um, so my next question is, um, I know, I, I don't know how I stumbled across this, but I stumbled across your newsletter uh, some time back, mm-hmm. T-A-A-R, but that's not around anymore, right? No, it's not. And it was, yes. And I published that newsletter, I think, um, I actually bought the newsletter from Rick Morgan, who was the original founder of it. Oh, okay. Another okay. old industry name, still around, saw yep. him uh, actually yep. a couple of weeks ago. And um, took that over, published that for, gosh, I don't know how many years, paper-based, monthly mailed, right, all of that kind of stuff. Right. And kind of with the 
the electronic and the internet, it became harder and harder to justify the expense of the monthly newsletter with the subscriptions, et cetera. So, and frankly, I got tired of writing it. Um, so um, it definitely, people still reference it and still wonder when I'm going to do it again. <laughs> but uh, any plans? Uh, with Catalyst, maybe. Um, okay. I, I still have this idea that um, physical stuff, a, a physical newsletter, has value. And, you know, it's so easy. I think they've like, maybe like me, you, others, we, I get a lot of email newsletters and I might glance at them really quick to see if there's anything that catches my eye. But typically it, I don't. And something physical in hand, um, there's a, a mastermind group I'm involved with that still sends out a monthly physical monthly newsletter mailed out. Wow. And it's wow. just it's just Those a different experience with it. So that that keeps running in my head um, of how to, again, engage in the digital world with people and build those relationships. Digital is here to stay, no question about it. But I'm not sure that we should just get rid of the, the physical part of that. And I do think that even for agencies, having postcard campaign, having a direct mail campaign to be part of their marketing arsenal uh, can be valuable. And again, I think you got to track it. You've got to figure out if it's working or not working. If it's not working, don't do it anymore. But we don't know that anymore because everybody I know of generally is doing um, electronic maybe postcards. And um, anyway, we can talk about the marketing stuff if we want. <laughs> well, so I'll leak a secret out to you, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'd say a good number of people in the industry know me who know me. They know me as the founder of IAOA. Right. IAOA stands for Insurance Agency Owners Alliance. I'm, I'm the current CEO and, and the original founder. Um, we are launching a digital magazine we don't call it, we don't use the word newsletter because it's that right. that relates to for a lot of people, especially our age, a paper, you know, mailed out right. newsletter. Yep. Which uh just go look at the publications in our industry. You know, I'm not gonna name names, but they're as skinny as they've ever been, right? Yes. Even with ad space in them, the editorial content just isn't there like it used to be at one time. So you know, uh akin to the bookstores maybe, you yep. know. Uh yep. Um, and Blockbuster and all them, uh, digital, you're right. It's, it's here to stay. It's just how do folks like you and I in our generation, the boomer generation, how do we pr produce a uh, content material and deliver it to the millennials and, and under, um, because they're the ones that are going to be the next in line, you know, in our industry right. to take over right. in whatever capacity. So IAOA has decided, um, mostly with my urging and our board of advisors, that I we will uh, launch and release our first issue in July. Great. And it'll originally be quarterly because mm -hmm. um, I'm the editor, so <laughs> I've got a lot of titles, uh, you know, right. behind my name. And with titles comes time, so I only have so much time. Will we push it to monthly at some point? Possibly. I haven't ruled that out. But uh, or, And if the first issue digital in July is 16 pages, don't even care. Because there's no printing to there's it. There's no printing. Right. Um, you don't yeah. you have to worry about signatures and right, all the nope, old printing. None of all that. But um, we are, we have, I have all kinds of content. Um, uh, creators who are interested in publishing their work. So sure. I'm, I'm not having any hard time, difficult time at all finding content. Mm -hmm. And most of it's very, very good coming from folks in the industry. So they're knowledgeable and, and experienced. Uh, and in my case, uh, it's called IOA Focus, a digital magazine. In our case, uh, I have an automatic audience because we just reach in IOA the 9,000 member mark. And our members, if those that don't know, are 100% independent, no captives, independent yep. agency owners. 
Owners means a partner, a principal, or an owner. You have an ownership stake in that independent agency. Um, vast majority of them are PNC, but we do have health and life and you know, senior benefits and mm-hmm. group benefit folks. But um, majority of them are PNC. So have an automatic audience. You know, here we have 9,000 members, and then we have uh, a sizable di- uh, email database where we can distribute this, and the distribution cost is almost nil. So that makes the, you know, cost of entry fairly reasonable. It's just a matter of the time it takes to put it together. Put it together. And I, ha- yep. I have a, um, uh, I have a team that does the layout work and and the artwork and all that. So I don't, I'm not skilled in that. So pass that on to those that can. And so we're going to test the market and see what the market says to us. They said so far uh, that we're interested. One of the reasons is because we're going to highlight IOA members and everybody loves to see their name in print. Everybody does. Yep. So we're going to do that. We already do a member of the month and, and, and member of the year. And we do those things in terms of recognition already. So anyway, uh, that's even great. though you, even though you, unless you owned an agency, would not be able to be long or be a part of our uh, group, our Facebook uh, private group, uh, you could subscribe via email. And so I'd be very interested in seeing your uh, initial reaction once we great. launch this. Yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to see I, it. I fully expect, I, I shouldn't say this because there might be advertisers <laughs> who are current advertisers who are listening, but I fully expect our first issue to be a bomb. You uh-huh. know, it, it's not going to be our best effort, uh, but it'll be an effort, you know, like everybody says, just do it and uh, well, improve, improve from there. You'll have a standard to to uh, base yourself or judge you yourself. You call that a, the experiment, so, right? And yep, you yep. improve and iterate. And I, yep, I, I'll absolutely. reference back to Seth Godin. One of the things I've always loved it is ship it, you know, just get it out there. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's just. It's like you said, it's likely to not be the best the first time out. And then that's it okay. Can't. There's Keep no way on. it can be the best. You know, nobody comes out with their best right off the bat. Well, and it, again, possible. I think you know this, but if, if they wait to come out with their best, then they never do it. And, and that's happens. right. worse, I think. Yeah, that's the, that'd be the calamity of the whole thing. So right. just do it, get better each time, better than the one before. And, uh, and measure along the way and see where it takes you. So I don't have any plans for it other than we're committed for the first year. We've got advertisers who have bought on for the entire year. So a number of them, a number of them have bought um, paid placements. You know, they want to be in certain spots. Yep. It's a little digital. It's a little different with digital uh, than it is with paper because the back cover, outside cover on a printed magazine is the highest price advertising space you can buy. You don't have that digital because this is a flip book. So right. you flip by page and right. you don't get to the last page till the very end. It can't happen any other way. So the back page is not near as valuable. Anyway, nobody wants to hear about that. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll, t- I'll let you know that um, there might be hope if this goes well for us that you could re um, reintroduce TAR, T-A-A-R, okay. To your audience that used to be, um, you know, paper readers and maybe digital will be accessible. I know podcasts and audio books are huge these days, so maybe you can put it on audio and ship it out there that way. Yeah, I agree with you. Those of us in our in our generation, I love a magazine. I love a hard copy book. I still love that. Um, I can read Kindle every now and then. But once you be conditioned to be such a learner that way. It's hard to adjust to other mediums because uh, I can listen with headphones on, but I can't put on like some people could put on a book in the car. I can't do that. Yeah. I just my brain doesn't allow me to absorb that, uh, which is probably a good thing. I should be focused on driving. I mean, focused but on driving. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's the question. Not, right? a, not a bad thing. But, uh, you know, that you're told to, you know, open up and listen uh, audio audible and and uh or have it read to you you know like Mm -hmm. uh, some books are narrated so anyway i've looked at other options and i still like i still like a hard copy but the the thing you and i have to realize is the folks that are 40 and under today in age they don't know hard copy right they never learned it so they're probably never going to go that direction majority of them yep so digital's the way for them and if they embrace it, you know, a slower, a smaller percentage of those 
45, 50, 55, 65, like us, a small percentage of those will embrace it, but there's still plenty of room in the, I'll say 50 and under or 40 and under yep. uh, age brackets to uh, absorb some digital content. So anyway, there you go. We'll see how it goes. IA, IAOA Focus, a digital magazine is the name, and we'll be coming out with that here in a couple of months. So, I look for, Like I yeah, said, I look forward go. to seeing it. Yep. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. So maybe your newsletter does have some life. Who knows? <laughs> so um, so let's go back to uh, we did went through your book. Oh, I know. So LinkedIn, I did review your LinkedIn profile. You and I have been connected on LinkedIn for a while, but we never talked. Didn't know we lived in the same city or same <laughs> metropolitan area. But if I read it right, your LinkedIn profile has three hundred and forty thousand followers that is correct you know you know that correct i do do you ever pay attention to the numbers uh, occasionally I, I would say just to see kind of what's happening curiosity um, yeah okay but do, yes. do you have one my question so my question about that is do you have one or two or three however many uh reasons why that came to be I, I have was one. it intentional was it accidental no it was well yes i would say both so the quick story is i think it was probably i don't remember what year now i'm thinking 2013 maybe 14 i uh, i got an email from somebody purportedly from linkedin inviting me to this new program called uh influencers so these were okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Were you already on LinkedIn at that point? I was. Okay. Yeah, I already had a profile. I don't even know how long ago that was. Um, and I deleted it, thinking it was spam. Right. Kept thinking about it, and actually pulled it back out, and um, ended up connecting. Actually, the guy's name was Chip Cutter. Uh, he's now a, a reporter with the Wall Street Journal. But um, set up a call, and he, it was real. And he said, LinkedIn is creating a program where handpicking people, and your name came up in the insurance financial services arena, and we'd like to invite you to become one of the original influencers. So I would say intentional. I said yes, accidental. I have still <laughs> have no clue how they came across me. How they got your um, name, yeah. And, well, was and, it because you had a sizable amount of followers at that point or something I, like that? I, I, I have no idea. And in fact, yeah. I'm not even sure followers were a thing prior to that. I think followers came with the influencers program. So what that did for me uh, is they LinkedIn promoted me to people in that broad industry, financial services and insurance. So right. my name would show up on people to follow. Uh, and so, yeah, over the next number of years, it it um, continued to grow. Um, and I, I get early access to new services at LinkedIn. Uh, cool. I, when I post articles or things like that, it, it the algorithm's a, a bit different uh, for me. And so that's just continued um, to grow there. But um, yeah, it was as I said, kind of intentional and accidental at the same time. So and, now that you have three there, go ahead. I, I, I was just going to say, and the, the whole, you know, LinkedIn is the primary place that I spend my time on, okay. on social platforms, partly because of that. Um, and it just goes to show that in professional stuff, um, LinkedIn is, continues to be a really good platform, and they continue to uh, develop services around helping you connect with the right people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was led right into my next question. So now that you have 340,000 followers, uh, and I love LinkedIn, I spend as much time or more than I do on Facebook, and I'm not on Facebook for any most of the social reasons, yeah. personal reasons. Um, it's just because a group that I founded, IAOA, is a private Facebook group. So, but LinkedIn. So, are you? Do you, would you say you now utilize that notoriety, let's say, on LinkedIn to further your causes? Yes, no question. 
and how even, does that... I mean, I, you're, you're a good example, right? Somebody who does yeah. research sees that number of followers and they go, oh, this person may know something or, you know, whatever, which I will, I will tell you for me that a part of that downside is I get connection requests from a lot of people from sure, literally sure. all over the world. Yep. A and that can be a problem because most people don't know how to use LinkedIn to actually connect. Mm -hmm. So right. I get lots of sales spam um, on those connection requests. And I'm pretty picky about accepting a, a direct connection request because of that. You know, yeah. I immediately get back, hey, I got this great product you should you you should be interested in. And it's like, I don't know who you are. Yeah. You know, and all again, so long. I have I a whole day long. Uh, rant on LinkedIn proper yeah. usage and <laughs> how you're damaging your brand on LinkedIn by improper usage. Oh, I could write a book on just that probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it drives me insane how these people, I want to ask them, do you really uh, gain business through this, right. this method? Yep. Is that, and, and there I are guess ways their to answer do it is yes. That do work, but most of the yeah. time people are not willing to put the work in to build those relationships and create those connections that actually no, no, no. can generate. No. So I actually, it's funny. I had a post in Iowa yesterday, somebody talking about LinkedIn and uh, a particular uh, a poser, I guess I would say a particular LinkedIn profile who kept after and after and after and like crazy amount of times. And I, and I, my comment was I, auto reject anybody who has in their profile the words leads referrals <laughs> i help businesses right any of those those are like ignore ignore right. ignore because yep. that you get the automatic message that says hey dave great to be a connection with you um will you watch this video right. and let me know you know some of them are very blatant Let's about it Let's, yeah, right. yeah, right off the bat, um, right. I just love connecting with people. So here's my calendar. Let's set up a call and just see if there's any way we can collaborate. And I don't know beans about them. Yep, I know. agree. And, and you know, what surprises me is, you know, our profiles are viewable. Did you not even right. look at them to understand? Well, or is it bots? That are doing I, I think a lot of it's bot type yeah, stuff, which, yeah. I, you know, I've I've looked at a few of those over the years and I just rejected them out out of hand. Not that's yeah. not how I, I use LinkedIn and nor do I want to. No, nor do I. And I only have like six thousand connections. So I don't know how you're managing it with the, that number of connections. That seems like a full time job. Well, um, I would say I batch it. So I let them go, you know, for time. accumulate mm -hmm. for a while. And then mm -hmm. I go down and I'm pretty ruthless, like, kind of like you, right? I check titles. I check how many con you know, common connections there are. I check if they even make a comment. I might right. look at that. But um, right. more often than not, I ignore them instead of accept them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So moving on from LinkedIn, because that yeah. we could talk about all day long, social media, you know, um, and I spend half my day on social media working business. Um, but let's go back to the Cadillac story. So okay. from what I heard you say early on, you got uh, contacted by three executives of, I'll just say local chapters of people don't know how the big guy works, but the big guy is a national association, the largest uh, and oldest in our industry, the insurance industry. And these three executives came to you and said, hey, we need, our members need help with technology, how to implement, how to analyze what they currently have, how to assess their current needs if they need to upgrade or implement further. And so Catalyst now is coming in on a consulting type basis and in a subscription model and allowing them to tap into your services and you're going to help them take it to the next level. Is that it in a nutshell? That is it in a nutshell. And and we have several tools we provide to agencies to help them with that. Um, so started with the three execs uh, from the states. So, um, I ended up having seven investment partners that actually invested money to get the platform up and running. 
And okay. we now work with about 23 state associations providing our services to their members. 23, wow. Um, so yeah, we've got a pretty good footprint. Um, uh, how many how many chapters are there? Well, um, total. They're not chapters, so we're just one platform. Yeah, I, I keep using the wrong terms. So. Yeah, um, but the twenty three states, seven what we call partner states, and then the others we call patron states that are offering mm -hmm. our services. That's when I mentioned earlier about pricing. There is a bit of a discount pricing for gotcha. patron state members. So, you know, if an agency is interested, check with the, the state um, right. and uh, we're willing to work with with, uh, you know, any any of the states. Mm -hmm. But we don't I, I did not want to build something that just threw a lot of information at agents that they tend to get a lot of information and frankly, probably don't understand most of it. So what I created what was it, right. what we call the Catalyst success journey. So four milestones around that journey, which is what I think agencies need to go through to continue to develop and, um, and, and it's the way I phrase it, continue to thrive. Agencies are doing well. We wanna help them continue that and do better. But those four milestones are baseline, what's the minimum technology an agency needs in order to be successful in today's world. Better is next. So, okay, what's that next step? And we've got lists of technologies that we think go into each of these milestones. So baseline, better, best, certainly alluding to best practices studies. What are the top 25% of agencies using and what should you look at and consider? And then the fourth is what we call beyond. What are agencies doing? And typically a small number, not a large number of agencies, what are they experimenting with now that have the potential to become best practices in the future? And in order to help an agency understand where they are individually, we created what we call the tech assessment. So a series of questions takes about 10, 15 minutes to complete. And we produce a report back to the agency that says, here's your score in five different areas of agency operations. And here are some suggestions on what you're, you know, here's what you're doing well. Here are some suggestions on things to start thinking about and putting in your strategic plan as you go forward. And so that's become a really good tool for agencies, one, not to get overwhelmed with all the new stuff out there, two, to have a plan in place and, and understand that it's a building process that you don't have to, and frankly, you shouldn't do everything all at once. Because one of the things I hear a lot from agencies is they go to meetings and they see all this great new stuff and how great some agencies are using it. So they go buy it and then they never get it implemented. So now they have stuff oh, they're yeah. paying for. You must Sits hear this the all shelf. the time, right? All they're paying the for stuff that they're not using. Or I had one agency, uh, at a, a board meeting I was at in Georgia, I still remember, who said, I have four different ways to email my clients. And I was like, why? You know, that's redundant. Are, should you get rid of some stuff? And so we call that tech stack management. You know, what do you have that you don't need? What do you don't have that you do need? And how can we make sure it all works together? Because, so the second thing we do is what we call a tech stack report or survey. And what we do there is we ask agents, what are you using? And how satisfied are you with the platform? And I believe for the first time, we have numbers now for market share, what agencies are using, and a rating, one to five stars, on how satisfied they are with the solution they currently use. So all of that information is actually put together in a report that we just released the second edition last month. Uh, we're recording this in May. Um, that's available to anybody, and we call it the State of Independent Agency Technology um, in 2023. And it lists where people are in those milestones and it lists what people are using and how satisfied are they in a lot of different categories of technology. We also added one question new to this edition. We asked agencies to tell us their top three carriers and give a rating on three different areas. One is how 
well does that carry, carry your think about the future? One to five stars. Two, what, um, how well does that carry or support your agency and their technology? And then three, how easy is it to do business with this carrier? And we've got lots of responses. Um, the report includes the top 51 carriers and their ranking. So we take rating on each of those three and then we do an average rating. And we include 51. The reason for that is those carriers had at least five responses from agents. So we felt that was a bit more valid information than I think we ended up with about 200 carriers total. So for the first time in the industry that I'm aware of, we actually are getting information about satisfaction level with carrier partners and with technology partners and helping then agents make those wise decisions about what platforms they should go to and use and utilize. All right. Is that data also going to be shared with carriers? Yes. It is, okay. and that's partly Careful. where we work with the states, so they take it back to the carriers in their states and use it as a discussion point. In fact, I was just in Wisconsin at their convention, and the uh, Matt Banachewski, the exec there, said he's already had discussions with carriers about the results of that report. And, and part of it is, Catalyst is a for-profit company we're not an association, so we can do things that they, maybe the association is more reluctant to do because they don't want to get carriers mad at them or, you know, all the political right. reasons right. that uh, we have to work around. So I am actually pretty excited about that and pleased with getting this information together. And that's literally available to anybody. Um, We'll put in the show notes a link to where you can go and download that report and take a look at who's using what and how satisfied are they. That would be completely cool. I appreciate that. I love the stuff, the things you're doing at Cadillac. Good luck with all of that. It's Thank uh, you. amazing work that our industry sorely needs. So yeah, we, and, we appreciate you. And, and we're not quite at your level yet, but we now have a little over 4,300 agencies that are part of our platform. So very nice. been growing pretty rapidly over the last couple of years. Very nice. Very nice. Um, so we're about ready to wrap things up here. So I'm just going to hit you with one of my uh, favorite teaser type questions that, you know, hits you by surprise, but it's not too painful. Uh, right now on your cell phone, what is your favorite app? Oh, I get some crazy questions, uh, crazy, crazy answers on this one. So I would have to say, and and literally, I just downloaded it this morning, but OpenAI just released the um, iOS app for ChatGPT. So oh, very good. I'm really intrigued. I, mm -hmm. So one of the things I do is look at emerging trends and try and figure out sure. how it affects agencies. And there's no question that generative AI, uh, and we won't get into a long discussion on that because I have a lot to say, but generative AI is and will impact agencies, I think mostly in a positive way when they learn what it is and how best to use it. So I'm doing a lot of work there, understanding what those parameters are and giving agencies specific help and guidelines on here's what it can do for you and here's what it can't do for you. So mm -hmm. anyway, that, so that's new. I would say other than that, just because it's top of mind, um, I travel a lot. So I would say several of my travel apps, um, mm -hmm. I come in handy a lot. Sure. So. Sure. My Yep, same here. Well, Steve, I want to thank you for your time. I know our listeners are going to be really, really happy to be able to listen to what you shared today. Um, you got you do so much for our industry. We can't even thank you enough. Uh, and it, it just wants you to know it does not go unnoticed. So well, thank, thank you, sir. And You're thanks for real, having me. This yeah. has been great fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're uh, very thrilled that you came on with us. So we will uh, see you down the road somewhere on your travels and we wish you safe travels and thanks once again for coming on to collabcast by ioa
Thank you for listening to CollabCast with IAOA with Captain Dave Jackson. Production and distribution by Podsquad.fm, Riverside.fm, and Spotify for Podcasters. Special thanks to Little Dog Social Media, Terry Champion, and all our guests and listeners. If you're an independent insurance agency owner, please subscribe to our podcast weekly. You can also request to join our agency owner exclusive Facebook group, IAOA, or Insurance Agency Owners Alliance at IAOA.com. Captain Dave Jackson signs out from sunny Hendersonville, Tennessee.